السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا تقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجال كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا تقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد And continuing brothers and sisters with the qualities of the servants of Ar-Rahman We come to the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where he says والذين لا يدعون مع الله إلها آخر ولا يقتلون النفس التي حرم الله إلا بالحق ولا يزنون ومن يفعل ذلك فيلقى يلقى أثاما يضاعف له العذاب يوم القيامة ويخلد فيه مهانا 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and those who do not call on others besides Allah, nor do they take a soul, take a life that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited except with due right, nor do they commit fornication and adultery. And whoever does any of these things, then they will meet a severe punishment. His punishment will be multiplied many times over on the day of judgment. And they will remain in the hellfire forever. However, there is an exception to this and we'll get to that when we talk about in the next khutbah, sincere tawbah. But today's khutbah, we're going to highlight the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَلَا يَزْنُونَ And they do not commit fornication and adultery. Zina, fornication and adultery in Islam, is considered one of the most immoral, one of the most indecent acts that a person can engage in who claims to be a Muslim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا الزِّنَا إِنَّهُ كَانَ فَاحِشَةً وَسَاءَ السَّبِيلَ And do not come close to fornication and adultery. And indeed it is an indecency and it is an immoral path, an immoral way. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you pay attention to this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't explicitly make zina haram. He said, don't even come close to it which is a form in the Arabic language of tekid. It is emphasis, to overemphasize the immorality of this behavior, the indecency of this behavior by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying not even to come close to it. It was such an immoral act that converting to Islam at the very beginning of, his, uh, of uh, the very beginning of the advent of Islam, people who converted to Islam they could only convert to Islam under the condition that they would stay away from zina. That was part of the shahada process. In today's time, we just tell someone, say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, khalas ala rat wal ayn, we accept you as a Muslim. During the time of the Prophet Sallallahu there were standards that the person converting to Islam had to agree to. Conditions, shurut, that they had to agree to as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the ayah that we're going to talk about. And this made it abundantly clear that this behavior, meaning fornication and adultery, would never, would never be associated with the qualities of someone who claims to be uh, a follower of, of the doctrine of Tawheed, even more so for those exclusive servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who are honored with distinction, as Allah called them, Ibad al-Rahman, the servants of al-Rahman. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam directly, Ya ayyuhal nabi, O Prophet, إِذَا جَاءَكَ الْمُؤْمِنَاتِ يُبَايِعْنَكَ عَلَىٰ أَلَّا يُشْرِكْنَ بِاللَّهِ شَيْئًا وَلَا يَسْرِكْنَ وَلَا يَزْنِينَ وَلَا يَقْتُلْنَ أَوْلَادَهُنَّ وَلَا يَأْتِينَ بِبُهْتَانٍ يَفْتَرِينَهُ بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَأَرْجُلِهِمْ وَلَا يَعْصِينَكَ فِي مَعْرُوفٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal nabi, O Prophet, if there comes to you believing women to proclaim their faith in Islam, you buy it, Nika, to give you bay'ah, to give you an oath of allegiance to follow you and accept Islam as their doctrine, accept them under the condition that la yushnik billahi shay'a. That they will not associate, number one, will not associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلَا يَسْرِقْنَا And they will not steal. وَلَا يَزْنِينَ Nor will they commit fornication and adultery. وَلَا يَقْتُلْنَ أَوْلَادَهُنَّ Nor will they kill their children, either by way of abortion or by way of burying the girls alive as it was a pre-Islamic Arab tradition of burying the baby girls alive. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالْمَوْؤُودَةُ سُئِلَتْ بِأَيِّ ذَنْبٍ قُتِلَتْ And on a day of judgment when the baby girl who was buried alive will be asked, بِأَيِّ ذَنْبٍ قُتِلَتْ For what reason were you killed? For no other reason other than, the, the, other than the fact that she was a female. Female infanticide. And that has 
also taking on many different forms throughout the throughout time and in today's time when I don't want to be pregnant I got pregnant by accident I got pregnant by a mistake I don't really want the child I abort the child I killed the child because I don't want it you don't want the responsibility that comes along with having unprotected sexual relations and especially in the case with someone that you had no business having sexual relations with to begin with so the child suffers as a result of your mistake. We kill the baby so that we don't have to live with that. Let alone that you have engaged in a behavior that is despicable in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but that's a whole other conversation. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was instructed to accept their shahada under the condition that number one, they did not associate partners with Allah. Number two, la yasrikna, that they, they would not steal, not take anything that did not belong to them. Nor would they commit fornication or adultery. This was at the very beginning, making it very clear that if you are going to become Muslim, that behavior is unacceptable here. Unfortunately, in today's time, we welcome everybody with open arms. You can be a part of the LGBTIQ community. You can be gay. You can be lesbian. You can be Muslim. You can be whatever you want to be and be a Muslim. No standards. Our standards are gone under the guise of being afraid of standing on our truth. So what are you trying to say? A person can't be gay and be Muslim? Absolutely not. This is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made prohibited, and a person who has made it halal on their own, then they have removed themselves from the fold of Islam, not by the act of homosexuality or lesbianism, but by istihlal, making something halal that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made haram. This is what will remove a person from the fold of Islam. Don't misconstrue my statement. A person who has accepted for themselves, made something halal for themselves, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has clearly prohibited in the Qur'an or on the tongue of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then they have removed themselves from the fold of Islam, not by way of the act itself, but by way of making halal what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made haram. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala admonished his prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for the same thing, Ya ayyuha nabiyu lima tuharrimu ma ahallallahu lak. Oh Prophet, why have you made haram for yourself what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made halal for you, seeking to please your wife? We don't make what Allah made haram halal, and we do not make what is halal haram. As the Prophet sallallahu said to Ali ibn Abi Talib when he wanted to take on another wife and put Fatima in a situation that would compromise her faith. The Prophet sallallahu went to Ali ibn Abi Talib and he said, Inni la uharrimu ma ahallallahu lak. I am not making haram what Allah has made halal for you. If you want to take a second wife, take on another wife. But not with my daughter. Not with my daughter. I'm not trying to stop you from being in polygyny. You want another wife? Fine, take another wife. But not with my daughter. You understand? He didn't make haram. What Allah made halal. However, he wanted to remove his daughter from that situation, realizing that it was way too much for her to bear, considering the fact that she had lost her mother, Khadija, she had lost her sister, Zainab, she had lost her sister, Umm Kuthum, she had lost her sister, Ruqayya. She was alone, Wahida, by herself. No one there to assist her, no one there to provide the cushion that a woman in a situation like that would need. But they would not commit fornication or adultery, nor would they kill their children, nor would they come with any lies or slanders against anyone, whether their previous husbands or anyone else. And they would not disobey the Prophet ﷺ in anything that is ma'roof, not disobey him in anything that he commands that is part of the religion. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَبَايِعْهُنَّ then give them, accept their bay'ah, accept their shahada under those conditions if they agree, and seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness for them, for indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's ghafurur rahim, forgiving and merciful. When Hind, the wife of Abu Sufyan, came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi to take her shahada, this was right before the conquest of Mecca. Conquest of Mecca, she comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi to take her shahada. 
The Prophet Sallallahu recites this ayat to her. You can take your shahada, you can become Muslim, provided that you do not associate partners with Allah anymore. You do not engage in any celebrations or any type of engagement that would conflict with the concept of Tawheed that is the foundation of your shahada. That you will not steal, you will not commit fornication and adultery. And she stopped the Prophet Sallallahu when he said that you would not commit fornication and adultery. And she said, Awatazni al hurra She said, does a free woman commit fornication and adultery? What type of stipulation is that? What does she mean by her comment? Her question, more of a rhetorical statement, spoke to the lowliness of Zina in that it was a behavior that even in a sacrilegious society like medieval Arabia or pre-Islamic Arabia, that was largely, it was largely associated with slaves or people of a low socioeconomic status rather than free men and women who had full autonomy over their actions and behaviors. She said, Would a free woman commit fornication and adultery? Who does that? That is the behavior of slaves. That is the behavior of people of low socioeconomic statuses. That's not the behavior of free women who have autonomy, who come from families, who fathers will marry them off. The women that of that stature don't engage in those type of behaviors. So the mere mention of it to her was an insult. She saw that condition to be an insult to a woman such as herself, considering that women of her caliber didn't do that anyway. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it wasn't the behavior of all slaves, but people who come from lower tiers of society, lower you know, socioeconomic statuses, they are usually in survival mode. And the committing fornication and adultery is a behavior that is associated with people who have low moral standards. It's not the behavior of somebody who has a high moral compass. It's the behavior of people of low moral standards. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited the slave owners from forcing their slave girls to commit fornication and adultery by way of prostitution. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَلَا تُقْرِهُ فَتَيَاتِكُمْ عَلَى الْبِغَى يَعْنِي الزِّينَ لَا تُقْرِهُ فَتَيَاتِكُمْ عَلَى الْبِغَى إِنْ أَرَدْنَ تَحَسُّنًا لِتَبْتَهُ وَعَرَضَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَمَنْ يُكْرِهُنَّ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ مِنْ بَعْدِ إِكْرَاهِهِنَّ رَحِيمٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and don't force your slave girls into prostitution, i.e. fornication and adultery. Seeking the treasures of this world, seeking monetary gain from this world. They're forcing their slaves to go out and to commit fornication and adultery so that they can benefit from the wealth of that. If these slaves desire to be chaste and righteous and upright, and whoever forces their slave girls or their slaves into this type of way of life, then indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after such compulsion, is ghafoor rahim is forgiving and merciful. So unlike free women who have their own autonomy, or free men and women who have their own autonomy, to choose righteous behavior, um, autonomy for slaves or people from low economic statuses was not their lot. Uh, and in most cases was not a luxury that they had. It was understood that free men and women were in control of their autonomy and didn't engage in immoral behaviors like Zina. Rather they were allowed general, rather they allowed the general standards of society to govern their behavior and Islam only enhanced that behavior with its exquisite moral code. That means that people who didn't engage in that before Islam, when they converted to Islam, the moral code of Islam only enhanced the behavior and the character that they already had. The Prophet ﷺ said, li al-akhlaq." I have only been sent to perfect moral character. I didn't come to bring moral character. Human beings usually have moral character. Islam, the system of Islam came to enhance the moral character of people who come from morally governed societies. That means if you were good before Islam, then when you become Muslim, you become greater. And when you adopt the doctrine of Islam, you become greater, not worse.
the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, تجدون الناس معادن كمعادن الذهب والفضة خياركم في الجاهلية خياركم في الإسلام إذا فقهوا إذا فهموا الدين the Prophet وسلم, said that you will find people like the precious metals of the earth. Some like gold, some like silver, some like iron, some like metal. These different metals that the earth produces, you will find the behaviors and characters of people the same exact way. He said, خياركم في الجاهلية, خياركم في الإسلام. Those of you who were moral, who were upright, who were good before Islam, will be moral and upright and better in Islam. Provided you get an understanding of the religion. The moment you gain an understanding of the religion, your moral code goes beyond the average. This is what Islam comes to do, to enhance. And so my question today for us to think is that if Hin said, what woman, what free woman would even engage, would engage in fornication and adultery? What woman would engage in such a behavior? If this was the thinking of Hin before she even converted to Islam, what do you think she would think about Muslim women today or Muslim men today who do engage in that behavior? Callously, carelessly. Like it's, like it's halal, like it's okay. We tell ourselves, Allah knows my situation. <laughs> that you are going to depend on a false hope that Allah is going to forgive you. When in fact, you had the ability to choose your behavior before you engaged in it. And you're going to rely on the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La wallahi. Ya ayyuhal insan, ma gharraka bi rabbika al kareem. Oh, you insan, oh, you human being, what is it that has deceived you about the generosity of your Lord? Don't think that because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is generous, merciful, forgiving, that on the opposite side of that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not shadid al iqab, is not severe in punishment. Shadidul Hisab, he's not severe in reckoning. Nabi Ibadi, Anni Anna al Ghafuru Rahim, Wa Anna Adabi Hua Adabun Anim, and inform my servants that I am forgiving and merciful, but also inform them that my punishment is severe and painful. Don't be deceived by the generosity of Allah. Don't engage in haram and then say, well, nothing happened, I'm, I'm fine, I'm good, alhamdulillah. Because it's only a matter of time before that catches up to you. It's only a matter of time. So what would Hin think if she accepted Islam today and found Muslim men, women engaging in these immoral acts and indecent acts? We live in a time where the immoral behaviors and low-level behaviors are perpetuated in all facets of our human experience. And therefore, it's normalized even to those whose moral compass should dictate otherwise. The inverted times that we live in has forced many to see morality and high moral standards as an extreme and absolutely unnecessary, similar to what the people of Prophet Lut said to him and his followers. We live in a time where right is wrong and wrong is right. This is an inverted society. The Prophet ﷺ predicted that this time would come. That there will come a time upon people where the times will be inverted. Right will be wrong and wrong will be right. The liar will be believed and the one who is truthful will be considered a liar. We see things as their opposite. So when a person doesn't engage in behaviors like zina, fornication, and adultery, people don't engage in that, they're seen as extreme. They're seen as unnecessarily extreme. I don't have a boyfriend. I don't want to engage in sexual practices with somebody that I'm not married to. Oh, you're extreme. MashaAllah, tabarakallah, extreme? This should be the standard. But this is how it's viewed today, as extreme. Multazim biddin, mutashaddid, person who holds fast to his religion is considered extreme. MashaAllah, tabarakallah, when in fact this should be the standard for every Muslim. This should be the standard for every Muslim. The Prophet, Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, listen to what the people said to Prophet Lut during his time. Walutan ith qala li kawmihi yatatun al fahisha, ma sabakakum biha min ahadin min al alameen. 
And remember when Luke said to his people that you are engaging in a fahisha and immorality and indecency, debauchery that no nation of people have engaged in before you, i.e. homosexuality and lesbianism. He said to them, إِنَّكُمْ لَتَأْتُونَ الرِّجَالَ سَحْوَةً مِنْ دُونِ نِسَا بَلْ أَنْتُمْ قَوْمٌ مُسْرِفُونَ He said, you men go to other men the same way that a man should go to a woman, with the same desire that a man should have for a woman. بَلْ أَنْتُمْ قَوْمٌ مُسْرِفُونَ Rather, you are a people who have transgressed all boundaries. You have no moral standards anymore. This is even in the Muslim community. And what was the reply of his people? And the only response of Luke's people was, let's get them out of our city. Let's get them out of here. Because they are people who like to be pure. I.e. extreme. Nonetheless, the exclusive servants of Ar-Rahman maintain the highest and most exemplary moral code without compromise, irrespective of time, situation, circumstances that society has all but succumbed to. From Prophet Yusuf السلام, who was secluded in the room with one of the wealthiest and most beautiful women in all of Egypt and refuses her, refused her advances with grace. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala captures this for us, this intimate moment between Yusuf and the wife of the Aziz, Zulaikha, when nobody else was in the room, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala watching from above the seven heavens, saw the whole entire event, captured it for us, took a snapshot of it, and put it in his final revelation for us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَرَاوَدَتْهُ الَّتِي هُوَ فِي بَيْتِهَا عَنْ نَفْسِ وَغَلَّقَتِ الْأَبْوَابِ وَقَالَتْ هَيْتَ لَكَ قَالَ مَعَاذَ اللَّهِ إِنَّهُ رَبِّ أَحْسَنَ مَثْوَاهِ إِنَّهُ لَا يُفْلِحُ الظَّالِمُونَ And the woman in whose house Yusuf lived tried to seduce him. She locked all of the doors and she said, Hey, Talak, come. She went and beautified herself, put on lingerie, did her hair, put on makeup, perfume. The whole situation set up. Come. And Yusuf, he refuses with grace. God forbid. God forbid I would engage in something like this. You kidding me? God forbid. Your husband raised me. I can't do this to him. Even if we did do it, we would never be successful. We would never get away with this. This is a man who saw the ending at the very beginning. That's called hikmah, that's called wisdom. Being able to see the end at the very beginning. But we, many of us, we lack wisdom, so we don't see the end, we just see the beginning. <laughs> I'll engage in this now and I'll make tawbah later. i ask Allah for forgiveness later. But what if there is no later? What if the angel of death comes to snatch your soul out of your body and he'll say, oh Allah, I repent. Now I repent. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to you as he said to Fir'aun, Alan, wa qad asayta qabl, wa kunta minam mufsidin. Now you want to repent? Later may not come for you. Stop saying I'll repent later. Stop saying I'll become righteous later. Oh mashallah, you're mutawwa' now. Inshallah, I'll, I'll become mutawwa' later. What if later never comes? Aren't you looking around? Those people are dying on a day-to-day -day basis. People that we know. There was a time when people would die and you wouldn't really know who they were or didn't have any personal connection to them. Today, people are dying. It's almost like every person that dies, you know them or have had some type of relationship with them. That's how you know death is catching up to you really quickly. You may be next. Or like Maryam who was in seclusion by herself, a young woman, 15, 16 years old. And while she was alone, she was approached by a young, handsome man who at the time, she didn't know it was Angel Jibreel, but she's in seclusion as a young woman and approached by a young man. But listen, listen to her response. 
Listen to her response with grace, with <laughs> dignity, with honor. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَاتَّخَذَتْ مِن دُونِهِمْ إِجَابَةً فَأَرْسَلْنَا إِلَيْهَا رُوحَنَا فَتَمَثَّلَ لَهَا بَشَرًا صَوِيَّةً And Maryam, she secluded herself from the rest of her community by herself. And while she's in that state, فَأَرْسَلْنَا إِلَيْهَا رُوحَنَا We sent our spirit, we sent Jibreel to her. فَتَمَثَّلَ لَهَا بَشَرًا صَوِيَّةً And he came to her in the form of a young man. When Maryam sees this young man, she doesn't see an opportunity for her to engage in moral immorality while no one else is watching. She sees it as an opportunity to seek refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She said, Inni a'udhu bil rahmani mink in kunta taqiyya. I seek refuge with Al Rahman, the most merciful. If you truly fear God, if you truly are God conscious, don't approach me like this. This is the standard. And in both of these situations, they were alone. This is taqwa. This is piety. This is righteousness. Not fearing Allah when you're in front of everybody else. Fearing Allah when you are by yourself. Khali and biwahdik. By yourself. Nobody else around. That is the real you. The real you is not who you are when you're in the masjid, you're around everybody else. The real you is when you are alone by yourself. So it didn't matter what the situation was or the circumstances, their moral code defined their behavior and they, it defined the subsequent outcome. Unfortunately for many of us today, we have allowed our environments to dictate our behavior while Islam and its pristine moral code has become our nemesis. That's the problem. Islam is the problem. Islam is our nemesis. If only this thing wasn't haram. If only I could do this, if only I could engage in that. Islam, we see Islam as the problem. Rather than seeing Islam as the solution. When Abu Talha al-Ansari, who was a non-Muslim at the time, he proposed to Umm Sulaim, who was a single mother, a new convert to Islam. She was the mother of Anas ibn Malik, who converted to Islam and only had Anas. Anas' father, Malik, he did not accept Islam and was actually killed as a non-Muslim. Um Sulaim converts to Islam. And it's a man who comes from a very prestigious tribe, who's very wealthy, very handsome. He comes and he proposes to Um Sulaim. There's a problem here because she's a Muslim woman and he's a non-Muslim man. With all of the great qualities, with as wealthy as he is, with as handsome as he is, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَلَا عَبَدُ الْمُؤْمِنُ خَيْرٌ مِّنُ الْمُشْرِكُ وَلَوْ أَعْجَبَكُمْ And a believing servant is more better for you. <laughs> Even if the non-Muslim man amazes you with his looks, with his physique, with his money, with his character, Islam is the number one quality that trumps all other qualities. I don't care how wealthy he is. I don't care how handsome he is. I don't care how built he is. I don't care what he has. If he doesn't have Islam, it, he does not measure up. He does not check all of the boxes. He does not meet the criteria. Don't say, oh, you know, he's a good brother. Inshallah, he'll accept Islam. That's a compromise that you don't have the luxury to make. Because quiet is kept. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes Muslims, not us. When Abu Talha proposed to Umm Sulaim, Umm listened to Umm Sulaim's response to him. She said, Wallahi ya Abu Talha, ma mithluka yurad. She said, I swear by Allah, I swear to God, O oh Abu Talha, a man of your caliber should never be rejected when he asks for a woman's hand in marriage. Rajul Tayyib, he's a good man. She said, ma mithluka yurad. A man such as you, a man of your caliber, should never be rejected when he asks for a woman's hand in marriage. She said, She said, but you're a disbeliever. And I'm a Muslim. And it's not permissible in my religion. According to my standards of my religion, it's not permissible for me to be married to somebody like you. I don't care how great you are. You don't have Islam. 
Therefore, you are disqualified. She said, وَلَا أَتَزَ uh, uh, She said, فَإِن تُسْلِمْ فَذَاكَ مَهْرِي وَلَا أَسْأَلُكَ غَيْرَ She said, if you accept Islam, I'll accept your shahada as my dowry, and I won't ask you for anything else. إِن تُسْلِمْ فَذَاكَ مَهْرِي وَلَا أَسْأَلُكَ غَيْرَ You accept Islam, I'll take your shahada as my dowry, and I won't ask you for anything else. She didn't say, I'm a desperate woman, I'm a single woman, Allah knows my situation, I'll take you as you are, and hopefully you'll become Muslim later on, inshallah, and engage in what is haram and displeasing to Allah. She stood her ground. I'm not denying that you're a good man, you're a good man. But I can't marry you under these particular conditions. But you accept Islam. And I'll make your Islam, your acceptance of Islam, my dowry, and I won't ask you for anything else. What do you think Abu Talha did? He accepted Islam. You understand? He accepted Islam. Because he saw a woman in front of him that was not willing to budge, not willing to compromise. Not willing to compromise. Innam al mu'minun al آمنوا بالله ورسوله ثم لم يرتابوا وجاهدوا بأموالهم وأنفسهم في سبيل الله أولئك هم الصادقون And truly those who believe in Allah are those who believe in Allah and His Messenger and they struggle and fight with their wealth and with themselves في سبيل الله in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala These are and they never since doubt They don't ever waver لم يرتابوا They don't waver they don't doubt. They don't get caught in a fork in the road and decide I'm going to choose my desires over obedience to Allah. It's always سمعنا وطعنا. لا غير. I hear, I obey. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes first. هو الأول ليس قبله الشيء. في الدنيا ولا في الآخرة. There's nothing that comes before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is al awwal the one whom there is none that comes before him. And that's how we manifest that in our lives. Um Sulaim is an example for us as men as well as for the women. And we can learn a lot from that and we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we obey the standards of Islam and that we adhere to the standards of Islam, that we adhere to the moral code of our religion. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adab al nar. Barak Allahu li wa lakum fil Quran al azim wa nafa'ani wa iyakum bima jaa fihi min al ayati wa dikri al hakim. Akulu ma tisma'un. Astaghfiru Allah li wa lakum wa li sa'il al mu'minin min kulli dham. Fastaghfiru hu innahu huwa al ghafuru rahim. Wa ataibu min al dham kaman la dham bala. الحمد لله الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على دين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك لا إقرار به وتوحيدا وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله سراج منيرا أما بعد Brothers and sisters in Islam the same moral code applies to the Muslim woman as well as to the Muslim man the Muslim man who seeks, as you have in today's time, many Muslim men who go after non-Muslim women for whatever reason they go after them for. However, in their pursuit sometimes of non-Muslim women, they tend to think that the moral code and the moral standard of Islam doesn't necessarily apply because you're going after a woman who is not Muslim. But let me tell you something, the moral code applies to the Muslim man and to the non-Muslim woman that he seeks. The Muslim code, the, the, the moral code doesn't change. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, اليوم أحل لكم طيبات وطعام الذين أوتوا الكتاب حل لكم وطعامكم حل لهم والمحصنات من المؤمنات والمحصنات من الذين أوتوا الكتاب من قبلكم إذا آتيتموهن أجورهن محسنين غير مسافهين ولا متخذي أخدان 
ومن يكفر بالإيمان فقد حبط عمله وهو في الآخرة من الخاسرين. Allah subhanahu wa taala says in this ayah, Muslim men, pay attention to this ayah. The moral code does not change. The standards of morality do not change. Don't think because you are in a relationship with a non-Muslim woman or you are pursuing a non-Muslim woman that all of the moral code of Islam goes out the window. The same moral code applies. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, اليوم أحل لكم الطيبات Today, today, all food that has, uh, 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 all things that are good have been made halal for you. And the food from the people of the book. Jews and Christians are halal for you. And your food is halal for them. And the chaste women from amongst the believing women are halal for you. And the chaste women from the women of the book are halal for you. Pay attention to the wording here. Chaste women. and muhsanat Meaning not a woman that you are sleeping with and then you turn around, give her shahada and marry her. And while that is great, you still have to answer for the sins that you committed in between. Her taking shahada wipes away her sins, not yours. When you take your shahada, the day you take your shahada is like the day your mother gave birth to you without sin. That's for the woman who takes her shahada. What about you? You've been in a relationship with this woman for a year, two years, three years. You have to answer for all of that. You have to answer for all of that. When she takes shahada, her slate is wiped clean. The Prophet said, Alla ta'alam anna al-Islam yajubu ma qablahu. Don't you realize that Islam wipes away the sins that came before it? That's for her. What about you? Muhsanat. That the chaste, righteous women from the people of the book, Christian women, Jewish women who are righteous, who uphold the same moral standards that Muslim women do in Islam. Brothers and sisters, let me ask you a question. Do you think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would mandate in Islam that as Muslim men, we go after chaste, righteous Muslim women who observe hijab, who practice chastity, who maintain their morality, their standards of morality, and then drop all of that when it comes to women who are not Muslim? The same standard applies. While Muslim men might think it's easier going after non-Muslim women, but that's because the non-Muslim women that we are pursuing are non-Muslim women who do not maintain the same standards as Muslim women. Because if we went after Christian women who maintain the same standards as Muslim women, then there would be no difference between Muslim and non-Muslim. They have the same standards. But we drop those standards when it comes to pursuing a woman who is not Muslim because we don't have to abide by that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that she has to be chaste, righteous. So if a Christian woman is going to entertain you as a Muslim man for marriage, she's not going to sleep with you before she does so. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says for the man, that you still have to give the woman a dowry. Even if she's a non-Muslim woman, you still got to give her a dowry. You still have to explain to her that she is entitled to a dowry, that you as a Muslim, according to your standards in Islam, you still are obligated to give to her. Maybe we didn't know about that. Maybe we conveniently forgot about that. You still have to give her a dowry. She still has to have a wali. Her father, some male, male member of her family, still has to be there to make sure that you are actually a fit for her, even as a Muslim man. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Muhsineen ghayra musafiheen. You as the Muslim man pursuing this woman, you should be muhsineen. You should be chaste. Ghayra musafiheen. Not someone who is engaging in zina. Wala muttakhidi akhdan. Nor are you engaging in this woman as a boyfriend or a girlfriend relationship. Allah has prohibited that. You understand? Even if we are pursuing Christian women for marriage, we still are not allowed to sleep with them until we marry them. The same standards apply. She should be righteous, chaste, and so should you. She should be given a dowry. 
She should be respected just like the Muslim woman is respected. She should not be violated just like the Muslim woman should not be violated. And these are laws, these are standards in our religion that unfortunately we have completely forgotten about. We have completely neglected with the creation of social media, with the creation of the free mixing in circles and, and environments where our religious, you know, laws and morals and guidelines are completely non-existent. Brothers and sisters, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be amongst the exclusive servants of Ar-Rahman where behaviors like zina, fornication, and adultery are beneath you. The same statement that Hin made when she said, Awatazni al hurra Would a free woman commit fornication and adultery? It's an insult for you to even stipulate that. It's an insult. Because people of my caliber, we don't engage in behaviors like that. It's beneath us. That's behaviors of slaves. That's the behavior of immoral people, indecent people. People who come from high moral standards, they don't engage in that behavior. I could have got up here and given a khutbah about zina being haram and quoted you every ayah and hadith from the Quran and the Sunnah about zina being haram that la yusminu wa la yughni min jur. That does not satisfy our problem. Our problem is not that we don't know that it's haram. We know it's haram. That's not the problem. The problem is that we have missed the mark as it relates to the moral code of Islam. That's the problem. I'm not going to sit here and give a khutbah about zina being haram and Allah said this, the Prophet said, we already know all of that. So then what's the problem? The problem is our moral code, our moral compass is compromised. Because of the environment, because of the situation, society that we live in, we are bombarded with immorality. So in that environment, we still have to be able to maintain our moral standard as Muslims without giving in to what's going on in society. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he forgives us for our shortcomings in this regard. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he, sex, he accepts from us our sincere tawbah. رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنًا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنًا وَقِنَا عَذَابِ النَّارِ Oh Allah, we ask you for the good of this life and the good of the hereafter and to save us from the hellfire. رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنًا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنًا وَقِنَا عَذَابِ النَّارِ اللهم تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم وصل اللهم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وآخر دعوانا عن الحمد لله رب العالمين وأقم الصلاة.